Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the RC West Oversight Committee Public Session. My name is Elena Kokolov Alford, representing California ISO Stakeholder Affairs, and I'll be facilitating the meeting today. Um, I'm joined by Chris Hoffman um, in the room at SRP, along with uh, Chris Stanford, Tim Beach, Trisha Johnson, um, Roger Shecker. Tepabula and um, representatives from WEC and PG&E and SRP all in the room there, and um, we will have several other presenters joining us. Um, before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping reminders to go through. This call is being recorded for informational and convenience purposes only. Please request permission from RC West before reprinting any related transcriptions. And materials related to the oversight committee, uh, including the agenda and this presentation, are available on kaiso.com. Stay informed, RC West, and you can scroll down to current meetings there. Uh, if you connected to audio through your computer or use the call me option, uh, select the raised hand icon on the top right above the chat window. If you connected outside of the WebEx, uh, you can hit pound two to raise your hand. And please remember to state your name and affiliation um, before asking your question or making a comment. If you need technical assistance during the meeting, please send a chat to the event producer. Today's event producer is Michelle. And you can also send a chat to me. Uh, my name is Elena Kovalev Alford or to all panelists. Um, our agenda today is um, after this, we will be doing roll call and we're gonna do it a little bit different today. Um, Chris Hoffman will be going through the list um, of each company. And um, when he says, uh, whoever you're representing, if you can select that raise hand icon, and we'll just watch for that and we'll confirm that we see, um, we see you. Uh, after that, Chris Hoffman and Christopher Stanford will go over oversight committee business and then hand it over for RC West operations updates by Tim Beach, Kathy Fernandez, Vera Vinakota, and Ong U, and then over to Raja for the FERC 881 update. Um, then we will go over some future agenda items, and there will be time for public comment at the end. Um, and we'll also be stopping for questions throughout. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Chris. All right, Chris, we are unable to hear you. I'm not sure which Chris, if it's Hoffman, or just be sure to unmute your, your audio. Yeah, sorry, I'm at the other side of the room. Can everybody hear me okay? Nope. <laughs> yes. All right, we'll try this again. Uh, do we have anyone on the phone from AEPCO, Arizona Electric Power Co-op? Right. Do we have anyone on the phone from Avista? How about Avon Grid? Uh, Arizona Public Service. Any raised hands at all? Um, I got Kit Blair, but I'm not sure. I think maybe we maybe we can confirm who we see. Um, okay, so Avista is not present. Um, oh, Avista is present from Mike. Okay, so I will check off. Got it. Avista. That seems to be a little bit tricky. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry to interrupt, but as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, the raise hand icon is above the chat window at the lower right hand side of your screen. If you are unable to see the raise hand icon, then please minimize your chat window and then you should be able to see the little raise hand icon and you can use that to raise your hand at World Call. Thank you. You know, I think it might be easier just to unmute for this if that's okay. Yeah, the, the hand raising is a little too tricky. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's unmute and then we can go through it that way. It was worth a try. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, everybody is actually muted, so I'll need to go through and start unmuting folks. Unfortunately, I have to do them individually, so please stand by while I unmute everyone. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, you will be unmuted um, for the roll call. Once we are done with the roll call, please remute yourself so we don't have any background interference. Thank you. And please don't remute yourself right now because I am going through unmuting, and unfortunately, <laughs> WebEx makes me do it individually. So thank you for your patience. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm still continuing to unmute everyone. Once again, once I unmute you, please do not unmute your line right away. You may mute your line again once we have completed roll call. So please stand by as I unmute everyone. <laughs> All right, I think I have unmuted everybody. Anyone who is unable to unmute themselves, let me know in the chat, but everyone should be unmuted. You may remute yourself once we are done with roll call. Thank you. All right, starting back over. Do we have anybody from AFCO on the line? Uh, how about APS? We have anyone from Bank? Jim Shetler's on. Thanks, Jim. Okay, Chris is on from CPA. Okay, so we've got it. Uh, Gabriel, Gabriel, I think I saw you on from San Jose. How about Chelan? Chris McDermott from Chelan. Good afternoon. It's Chris. How about Hetch Hetchy? Yes, Elise Kimes is here. Thanks, Lenise. Uh, City of Reading. How about Douglas County PUD? This is Jeff Hemminger with Douglas PUD. Thanks, Jeff. How about Grant County? Leroy Patterson, Grant County. Thanks, Leroy. Um, Idaho Power? Robert Phillips, Idaho Power. IID. Anyone on from Lone Star? Okay, anybody on from LADWP? <laughs> Glenn Berry for LADWP. Thanks, Glenn. How about Los Alamos? <laughs> Okay, Modesto Irrigation District. Toxie Burris is on for MID. Thanks, Toxie. Uh, how about Montana, Alberta? Hi, this Hi, is Andrew, Northwestern Energy. This is also Annie Chopra with the Montana, Alberta tie line battle. Perfect, thank you. How about Nature Inner? Power watch or wind watch. Uh, do we have anyone on from NV Energy? Uh, Eric on from PAC. Sandra on from PG&E. Uh, anyone on from Portland General? Bob Frost from Portland is on. Thanks, Bob. How about Public Service New Mexico? Uh, Puget Sound? I see, I see Evan's on there. 
Um, how about Southern Cal Edison? Yeah, Tim Keenis and John Battenschlag. Thanks, guys. Uh, San Diego Gas and Electric. Uh, Robin Minigut with San Diego. Thanks, guys. How about Seattle City? Uh, anyone on from Silicon Valley? Uh, Sacramento Municipal. Spud. Snohomish. Snohomish. How about Tacoma Power? Anyone on from Transbay Cable? How about Tri-State? Michael Holcomb is here from Tri-State. How about Turlock and Turlock? They review the training on it. Well, we train on this every week. We train on this every week, you know. Now you're going to add in more training on it? It's a compound. There are cases where it could take care of something. All right, how about from Lapa, Sierra Nevada region? Just a reminder to, to everyone, if you are unmuted, um, please mute yourself or um, wait until your roll call. Thank you. Sorry about that. So, uh, Corey Danson's on for Sierra Nevada. Getting some sort of trainer. I'm talking more like simulation. Uh, if I missed anyone, put it in the chat and we'll get you there. These real time, and you can you can trip them out line with somebody. You can give them high. You guys got Evan Sorrell from Puget, right? We did, Evan. Thanks. Trevor Schultz from Idaho Power. Let's go. All right, thanks, Elena. I think we'll jump into uh, business. Um. Was going to say we, do, we don't have meeting minutes from last time. Do we? No. Uh, other than that, thank everybody for coming over today. Um, sorry, the cameras are pointed a little bit funky. Uh, unfortunately, I guess I got both chair and vice chair this time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, the cameras are pointed a little bit funky. I know this is the first time we've been able to do this. Special thanks to WEC for doing a presentation. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Rick. And then Scott Anderson, who's no longer here, for doing the presentation on our operational readiness from Salt River. Uh, we got some really good feedback, so thank you very much. Um, that's all I had. Chris, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, just a thanks uh, out to uh, you, Chris, and to SRP for hosting the in-person meeting today that um, – I had planned on being there in person, but Mother Nature had other uh, plans. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Yeah, some funky weather going on down here, uh, everywhere else. But, so, thanks, everyone. With that, Elena, why don't we go ahead and move over into RC West operations update? Okay, thank you. Before we get started, John Phipps said uh, planned on coming here, but he had a Last-minute conflict, the uh, priority of the examiner will attend, but he wanted to uh, thank everybody for uh, um, attending and, and participating in RC West, and also thank uh, SRP for hosting this meeting. Much appreciated. So thank you. Get to the next slide. Okay, good. Uh, we're going to go over a few things here on the operations side, talk about our energy emergency alerts, EEAs for 2022, uh, talk about some of the NERC RTOS activity, and really that's the activity that's going to touch on all the TOPs, the PAs eventually over the next year uh, and the year after. And then some NERC standard changes that are coming that we're going to form a joint task force to address. Next slide, please. Okay, so you're looking at this is the EEAs we had from 2022. So we had a total of 42, um, 19 uh, watches, 19 or nine watches, 19 EEA1s, 7-2, two, level 2s, 
in seven of all threes. Um, 32 of those occurred during our heat wave in September. So when we hit those heat waves, we do see a lot of uh, EEA activity and that's really rep replicated in uh, our year to year trends where 2020, we had the course of August heat wave that uh, was WEC wide and we had a number of EEAs at that time. 2021 was a little milder in temperature. Um, so we were able to uh, you know, see a reduced uh, activity in that area during that year. Uh, also last year, we set historical peak loads. RC West set a historical peak of 130,985 megawatts. WEC, uh, WEC's historical peak was 167,530 megawatts. Um, so one thing I take a, took away from this the difference between 2022 and 2020 was, of course, 2020, we were in the pandemic and it was a WEC wide heat wave. And we had quite a bit of challenges in that area. 2022 uh, was hot, especially in California in the Southwest, a little cooler in the Northwest, still warm, um, but we were still seeing those record level loads. If we see another weather pattern like we saw in 2020 with the economic uh, recovery from the pandemic, I think we'll see greater peak load conditions. So there's more load out there, basically. Next slide, please. A couple of things that are going on at the RTOS level that you probably have already touched on a little bit. Um, recommendation 21 is operator training simulations of firm load shed scenarios, in particular uh, rotating load and how to manage that. Uh, the ARP, we went back and looked at the, the alerts and now the, the respondents, 185 entities responded that they do rotational load shedding. However, that does not incorporate what uh, the cold weather recommendation was looking for, and that is um, long duration of rotational load, not something to get to your peak, but something that may get you through a couple days. So we're going to refer back to, to our, our STC um, and ask for the direction and where they want us to take it. Do they want a reference paper out of this? Uh, do they want to form a training task force, or will they go as far as a SAR? Uh, so eventually that's going to get to your training teams and, and really try to incorporate in probably your rotational or your um, restoration drill, some kind of uh, long duration um, load shedding, rotational load shedding, how do you incorporate and protect natural gas resources and that type of thing. So that's, that's going to be coming. Any questions on that? If you raise a hand, I'll try to address it. We can move on to the next slide then, um, please. <coughs> Recommendation 22, this is a little more difficult topic. Um, it really deals with F UFL's coordination with frequency tripping relays on generators. Um, there was some uh, miscoordination in the Texas event and other events where our generators were tripping off before they got into some of the rotational load blocks. So there's a, there's a concern about coordination there. I went to the SPCWG first. They also referred it to us. But in essence, there's a SAR project right now, 2020-02, the PRC-0246, which was initiated in 2018, is incorporating generator right through characteristics. Um, the comments are closed in that SAR and it's going to be out here pretty soon. Uh, our main intent uh, to address this recommendation is to look at uh, the, uh, monitor the progress of the SAR and any resulting requirements. We will try to comment on them as a subcommittee rather than back at our entities as far as what NERC was, the NERC RSTC was looking for. Um, it could be, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, we're going to monitor, but we're going to look for possible deliverables. Could be recommended changes to UFLS PRC006. We could develop a coordination guide, um, condition or alert, or recommend back to the RSTC subcommittee for further direction or the SPCWG. So that's going to be coming in the next year. We have that as a high priority at the RTOS going forward. We will be, in addition to uh, looking at and watching that SAR, we tend to go back and, and try to look at some of the events where we can identify where missing coordination that happened in the past. We know there's a couple of events out there, um, 15, 20 years old now, 
where there was miscoordination of generation tripping with under frequency load shedding. They actually shed generation before they shedded their load and exacerbated their position. So that would be something we'll be looking at going forward. One of the really concerns we have on the RTOS side is the generator ride through time for a frequency stall. In the Eastern and Northern connections, it has a different time frame from 20 minutes in the Eastern connection down to three minutes in the Western and Northern connection. If the thought is that the system operator is going to interrupt or recover from a stall within that certain time frame, that's probably not workable in the Western and Northern connection at three minutes for a quick descending event. So we're going to try to look at incorporating in our recommendation, depending on when it comes out of the SAR, addressing some of those inconsistencies going forward and make sure we capture and don't put our operators in a position where they're expected to recover from an event that there's probably no way they could do it. So that's our direction going forward. We do have a question in the chat from C.D. McLean, CEC. The RC West operator ought to also consider differentiating the reporting of EEA events by the nature of their initiation to the extent that a BA can call an EEA event. These ought to be classified separately from RC declared EEA events. It's in the chat there. So I think that the clarification is that when the entity is requesting an EEA, the RC is declaring a corresponding EEA. We haven't had a case where the entity thinks there's an EEA and the RC says, no, we don't think we need one. So those will always correlate. That will not happen. So if a BA believes that they are in an EEA condition, we're going to declare it for them. We may sound check them on it. We may, you know, give them a sounding board and provide it. But if they want their EEA, they're going to get it. We're not going to be in the position where we declined an EEA and then something bad happened afterward and they come back on. So we're going to respect the EEA declarations or requests from balancing areas. There's many reasons why a utility may want to declare an EEA outside of, you know, the normal parameters we think about. They may want an EEA because they have to get at some generation that they can unless they have an emergency declaration. We don't have knowledge of those things, so we try to respect that. Also lightens up or opens up certain demand response programs and that type of thing. So we're always, always doing that. Okay. I don't see any other questions or raised hands. Okay, good. Thank you. That's a good question. If we go on to the next slide, please. So there's an IRR project in Vic here that was also a member of that team that went back and went out and reviewed and surveyed all the reliability coordinators on their different practices as far as establishing IRLs, terminology, all the different aspects of an IRL. Their hope is that in the long run, we really want to make it consistent amongst RCs on how they treat IRLs and really make certain items within the paradigm consistent. So they looked at terminology. They looked at IRL parameters, how an IRL is defined or found, local versus wide area, what that means to some people. Some people consider it by a lot of megawatts. Others think about it as does it impact adjoining neighbors? If not, then maybe not. It's not an IRL. If it's above 1,000 megawatts and it's an IRL, if it's below that, it's not. So there's a lot of different ways of doing that. How IRLs are established in real time or day ahead. Here at RCUS, we establish our IRLs in the day ahead time frame. And anything that's found in real time, we call an insecure operating state. Some other companies do a similar method, but when they get into real time, they call it an SOL plus condition or things like that. So, you know, sort of really different terminologies. And really, it's a good effort to really sort of sync us all up together. The different tools that are used for monitoring IRLs, VSAT, TSAT, TSA, and thermal. You know, we have an IRL thermal BIC logo in RCUS that's present when there's an outage condition, certain outage condition. That's a thermal. That's a cascading thermal IRL. Our others are based on voltage stability. They're going to talk about RC to RC communication. 
NERC standards, and there's also a philosophical discussion about IRLs as well as an appendix, I understand, where they discuss one of the items that I think came out of the survey was violating an IRL is very punitive, right? It's a big deal. But in some ways, it may be de-incentivizing people from declaring IRLs or looking for ways around it. So they have a philosophical discussion in that. This draft white paper is under management for you at NERC right now. Once that's released and published, they're going to hold a webinar workshop to address that and take questions and that type of thing as well. And then once that's done, the NERC RTS is going to go back into the reliability guideline for establishing IRLs and make it consistent with the paper going forward. Really quick, Tim, before you go on, it looks like CEC still has a question related to that previous slide. So, and I'm not sure what it's referring to because RC West operator ought to consider reporting adjacent RC EEA events, demonstration of transparency and collaboration. So, yeah, all EEA events that we receive that are declared in Western NERC connection, they are posted on the GMS message. And they also go out on the RCIS, which is the Reliability Coordinator Information System. So in that respect, you know, they're all, they're shared. We don't, we don't, we haven't developed a consistent report and we probably look to WEC to do that if they want to do a synopsis of all the EEAs in the Western NERC connection between RC West, Alberta, BCRC and SPP. We'd expect if that would happen at that level, I would think. That answers your question. Hey, Tim. I think, and maybe I'm wrong here, this is Dave Gilbert. So when we, when we are in a situation where we think we're going to be in an EEA event or we think we qualify for one, the BA can call the RC, but we still request that they declare us EEA deficient, right? As far as for the Reliability Coordinator function, right? That's correct, yes. We can do it as a BA, but to make it RC West wide, it has to actually be the RC that declares us that. So there's a separation there between our BA operations and what the RC is going to declare. Yeah. So in the last comment there, yes, on the, those are not necessarily public channels. So I know that for the RC West area, the RC's EEA declarations do go out to subscribers via email, but they're not necessarily posted to our kaiso.com website. So if you're not subscribed to the emails, then yeah, it's not necessarily transparent publicly. You're posting them on GMS though too, right? GMS is closed channel though. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, so there may be, you know, something in the future in terms of, but right now the only public reporting would be at the high level, like what was shown on the previous slide. This, this presentation is posted on our public website. Right. Correct. Tim, will the topic of declaring EEAs keep us straight here? My understanding is that only RCs can declare EEAs. Correct. Yeah. BAs can request that the RC declare an EEA, but the BAs can't, you know, declare the EEA themselves. That's correct. Yeah. That's the order of things. Like I said, we'll, if somebody requests that we're going to, we'll soundboard you on, but we're going to, we're going to declare. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We go to the next slide. There are some standard changes coming to effect. They'll be effective April 1st, 2024. They're going to touch on FAC 11, FAC 14, IRO 008, and TOP 1. And we intend to address these, these standard changes and review our procedures and methodologies. And we're going to repurpose our voltage SOL task force for that. So in the near future, if we can go to the next slide, please. You'll be getting some information on that task force, but primary objective is to, is to, is to align the TOP and TPL standards as well as 
new definitions and the, in the updated new requirements as the following. Um, proposed, you know, the SOL definitions are coupled with the fact standards, so there's more consistency there. Um, and also, you know, support the concept that the SOL is an operating parameter and eliminate confusion of operating to what the limits are versus how should the system operate be given given these system operating limits. So how should you operate this area given the limits that are in, in, in effect? So it's a little bit of a philosophical look at things, but that's sort of the general approach is not just pushing the system to the limits and adjusting for it, but how to operate that system within those limits. Hey, Tim, on that topic, I wanted to let you all know that um, WEC and Reliability First region, we're collaborating together to put on, um, it's, I don't know what they call it, kind of like a, a um, informational session on this topic, on the new fact standards. It's, I, I think it's scheduled for some date in March. I'm not sure that the, the specific date is hammered out, but it'll probably be like a, a half hour presentation giving an overview of, this, of these revised standards. Okay, so good. That might be something worth, worth dialing into. Sure, yeah. And I'll forward you, as soon as I'll find out the yeah. information, I'll forward it to Chris, and, you know, to, to spread the word. Great, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the, you know, the updated SOR, RCF, SOL methodology, you identify TOPs and use, you know, determine which facility ratings are, are provided by the owner. Um, and are appropriate for using the established SOLs. And then under the revision of this also, the facility ratings will be the SOL. Additionally, RC and TOP will to use the same facility ratings. So we want to be consistent in how we operate to those ratings between the RC and TOP. Um, we're going to require the TOP to determine system limits for use in our operations. We pretty much completed that part of it already with our SOL task force that we uh, uh, completed earlier this year, and, and Sam's is going to discuss later. Next slide. Um, the updated reserve, you know, revised comments are set a number of minimum required attributes, specific disability limitations that must be contained with NESO methodology. So we'll be looking at that, making sure methodology is consistent with the requirements as far as those attributes are concerned. Describe how contingencies are identified and allow for different contingency lists to determine stability and steady state and system impacts. So that's going to be a little bit more complicated, I believe. And, you know, Roger, if you have anything to say on that, that'd be great. But um, so we'll be looking at that as well. And then also describe the performance framework to determine XLS, SLS exceedances. Right. I think one thing Merck is trying to use the standards to come up with a, like a uniformity across all TOPs to define what is the emergency rating, what not. So they didn't specify that, but at the end of the day, I think they want RCs to work with TOPs to come to, to come up with a, a common understanding of those what emergency ratings are and, and how do we uh, uh, then RCs use those and call it SOL exceedances. What is the SOL exceedance? Yes. There's a lot of changes in the sense, you know, how much time you have with a pre-contingency soil exceedance versus post-contingency, right? How long a time you have to make sure there's a coordination going on between RC and the TOPs and, and TOPs have an action plan to solve that issue. So those are things that NERC wants to uh, utilize these, these standards to, to, to help right? everybody on the same page. So, yeah, as Tim mentioned, I think we'll uh, reinitiate the OPWG uh, task force and then actually talk about this uh, OPWG group and talk about these things and, and create a task force and, and move forward. So if we go to our next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, yeah, so our next step, like as Roger was mentioning, we're going to repurpose our RTWG, OPWG task force. Um, so that's the best voltage SOL task force. We'll be looking for if you're going to re up as a membership to that or de delegate to another individual within your organization to take part. We're going to work on the task force objectives and scope, and then also we'll uh, you know, identify impact of methodologies and procedures uh, going forward. So in particular, our SOL methodology and our SOL procedures. And we hope to have a kickoff meeting here in April sometime soon. So there'll be an email going out uh, relatively soon, I believe. Raja's team is going to lead that, um, and he's delegated to Lee Ching. Yeah, well, yeah, I'll announce that, yeah. 
you know, the league shape. So look for something that in the near future. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be a amount of work to go with it. You know, if you were part of the voltage just well task force, uh, that was uh, quite an effort, but it was well worth the while. So we appreciate, appreciate that. We're going to ask you to do it again. So <laughs> thank you. Um, and lastly, we don't have a slide for this, but Raj, I wanted to, uh, give him the opportunity to talk about the frequency response monitoring and mitigation task force and sure. where's that today? Yeah, uh, I know uh, the RC West is aware, right? The, the, the committees are aware that uh, RC West has been working on the frequency response, uh, developing tools for that, as well as developing a procedure, utilizing a task force. Uh, we we're, we we're planning to go to parallel operations last year, late last year, but uh, there were some concerns with technical issues, technical questions that uh, a couple of TOPs had. So we've been working with the TOPs to resolve those concerns. Now the TOPs are right have resolved those concerns. I think the next step for us would be start parallel operations. Uh, uh, and what does that mean? Parallel operations. We want to, uh, uh, in a way, not it's not real. Just give an opportunity for RCs operators and then the RC engineers in the control room to look at the tools in real time. And 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 if there's if there's a if they if it, the tool triggers and 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 an issue then. Look into that and make sure work with our, uh, work with the TOP is behind the scenes to make sure that everybody agrees with the part we're seeing the tool, right? So everybody's good with the tool right now. Technical questions have been resolved, but it's not, it's, 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 it's more of a given opportunity for everybody to be on the same page in real time without actually using the tool in, 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 in taking actions. That's, that's what battle operations. So, uh, we, we're going to reconvene the task force, that frequency response task force that was created. We're going to, uh, uh, have the meeting, set up a meeting with the task force and talk about the parallel, parallel operations so that Everybody's aware of it. What does the parallel operations mean? Uh, and then go forward. So we haven't set up uh, a timeline how long we'll be in the parallel operations, and we're working on right now uh, uh, like criteria that we can use, uh, or that we can use and say, yep, the parallel operation is successful and move into parallel productions, right? So we're trying to establish on the criteria. Once we know the criteria, we'll definitely uh, have to share that information at the task force and move forward. I know most of you guys are aware of it, but it's right the, the, the work that's been going on on the task force side. Thank you. Roger, this is the tool that it was, I think you presented yep. at the RRC meeting in exactly. the summer, right? Yep, okay. right, yep. That's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, but that's further along, we'd love to get another project on it. Oh, yeah, sure. have yeah. Some experience with it. Yeah, 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 definitely. I think we, the tool is running, is just now we want to start parallel operations from, mm -hmm. uh, from, uh, and get better, uh, handle on that, right? Displays, procedures, and everything, the RC operators are aware of it, right? So, yeah, we really need to test the monitoring yeah. in real time. Yeah. That's, right. that's what we need to do at this point. Cause it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. We'll share more. Yeah, yeah. Once we start parallel operations, definitely mm -hmm. an opportunity to, to share more information that, yeah. We're exited of the tool. Yeah. Hopefully we'll, uh, we'll go forward with the parallel operations and, uh, we'll do the next step, actually utilize the tool. Yeah. A lot of folks are really excited about that tool. Yeah, so definitely. It's, so I think it's a, it's, 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 it's a first in any, right? Anybody in the, yeah. any ISO or RC is doing this, the first one that your uh, RC was doing things. Very innovative. Yeah. Really good. Okay, so that's the operations update. Uh, we're going to run to procedures now, unless there's questions. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, you can select the raise hand icon on the right side or type it into the chat. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, yeah, and just to address the last comment there, um, SPP does post their GMS messages. They do get copied over from their message system under the GMS system. So you should see those when they're declared for those that have access to GMS, that is. Um, next, we're gonna move on to procedures update and that would be Kathy Fernandez. Kathy? Yes, Tim, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, this is Kathy Fernandez. I am um, talking with you here about the um, recently published procedures. Um, we have a, a, a few that were for annual or their periodic review with minor changes like RC9010. Um, RC9230 was updated to include um, IPCO mitig mitigation actions using real-time market constraints management and um, 
uh, various other updates. Um, our C9410 was again a periodic review with minor edits. Our C120A, we had a, a change um, that we wanted to put out before the um, April 1st um, publish that we already had, had put out there. So this has um, an additional change uh, where we um, updated uh, the data transfer method on 4.9 and 4.10 to match SOL methodology. Um, so there, there was that change. Um, RC 92.30 periodic review, RC 120. Um, this was the annual review for the, with the 4.1 changes here that were published in December for 4.1. Those are put out there in advance, and then just before 4 1, we'll be um, putting those out as the current procedures. Um, is there any questions for this slide? Okay, any we can go questions? Okay, can we go on to the next slide, please? Okay, and here's a few more. Um, the majority of these here are for annual review. Also, our RC120B and C is part of that 4.1 um, update. And then we had uh, RC600 and 600A for annual review. Those were effective on January 1st. And then RC670A was also, um, that was actually December 15th. So, uh, minor updates with the DDR list. Uh, I believe that's it for the recently published. Any questions on this slide? Okay, we can proceed to the next slide. Um, here are upcoming procedure changes. Um, again, quite a few of these are coming up for annual review um, with no changes. RC210 is um, being updated for the EOP 11.1 um, update, so that'll be effective um, also for one. And then RC 330, 330A, B and C, those are all going out for annual review. And uh, 330 was be because of that EOP 11 change, so they're all going out at the same time. And then a minor update with the reference of um, NV, NVE there. Um, let's see, RC410, um, those are uh, 410, 410A, and 410B are all annual reviews. RC9000, um, that one was just, um, it's going to be published. I was planning to publish it today. I haven't gotten it out yet, but it'll go out this afternoon. Um, this is uh, with clarifications to section 3321 regarding operating limits for PATH 66, when one contingency away from open loop and monitoring for potential insecure operating state. So um, again, that'll be going out today. RC9030, it's a major update and reorganization, um, added background to provide clarity on different types of oscillations. Um, and other related um, updates. And then RC9210, that'll be coming out um, for an annual review. So I believe that's it. Are there any questions for any of these updates? Okay, I think that's all I've got. If you can continue to the next slide just to, okay, great. That's all I got. Thank you, everyone. This is Thank the you, Kathy. We're going to move on to RC metrics now. Yes, this is the Um Raju is going to present. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. I think the anomalies and the telemetrics or the metrics or the flow on the slide. Uh, 
and it is for the whole year as we've seen that uh, from August onwards is a um, significant reduction. Um, though the ports were there uh, through the year, uh, but there is, um, as we can see, um, at certain point of time, some parts of time, uh, certain um, uh, uh, certain efforts get uh, prioritized. Uh, uh, so the, the tendency that we'll see uh, that some changes in that, but overall, the compared to the several years uh, on the anomalies, uh, count of anomalies, there's been a historic low. Uh, the measurements have increased the four fold in the last eight years. The um, the anomalies are currently around uh, 300 <coughs> at any given point of time. <coughs> so far less than uh, the or 600 than when the system was uh, eight years ago, eight years ago, even uh, one fourth of this uh, number of measurements. So that's about it. On the finite KV, is still uh, always uh, it's a, the challenge we've been addressing both at the modeling level and several other measures. Uh, uh, there is an attention on this. Uh, we wanted to bring them down. <laughs> And then the telemetry errors also, there's a significant reduction over, over the year, particularly after the new EMS implementation. So that's all I have on this slide. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Thank you. Here, uh, the, on the devil's continuous this, uh, uh, Though the picture looks uh, as there's so much fluctuation, but the number of continuances that we see typically are uh, in the range of two to five. So even a one number change would, uh, would look uh, significant, but otherwise uh, they're, um, they're pretty, pretty much in the a narrow band of in the range of two to five. And currently in the system, we have uh, between two and three. So that's, uh, Kind of a scenario we have, and very uh, generally speaking, it is uh, uh, quite uh, steady in that range. Thank you. Next slide, please. I think that's all I have for these two slides. Yeah. Um, probably I would uh, go and go and present on this. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, this is Al U from RC West. Um, this is for the uh, DACA accuracy that we discussed before. Uh, while we maintaining the uh, DACA accuracy comparison with the uh, RTCA, and then you know how many of those, uh, the constraint we didn't see and then we saw in the uh, real time. So for the last quarter, we still maintaining it and then we're trying to improve it. Can you go to the next slide, please? I think a little bit of the, uh, this one is the archery metrics for CD issues. So uh, I would just keep going, I guess. Um, the, uh, these are the amount of CD inquiries uh, submitted based on the uh, different types and then you know how long it took from the uh, ISO or RCUS to support them and the resolve them. And the time, you know, for the last quarter the average business day to closing the tickets, we are improving and not faster. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. This one go to Roger for the uh, for 881. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Raja Tapitogla, Director of Operation Engineering Services. Talk about the FERC 81 uh, AR and dynamic line rating, what our RCVS is doing. Thank you. Next slide, please. So, again, uh, pretty much everybody knows, but I'm still going to have a slide to talk about what this initiative is about, right? Uh, it's designed for Carter 881, is designed to improve transparency and transmission line ratings. 
that's the main purpose that uh, for created this order. It requires the transmission owners to implement ambient adjusted ratings on transmission lines over which they provide transmission service. That is another key uh, criteria, right? What equipment that they need to provide uh, ambient adjusted ratings. It requires, at the same time, it also requires ISO RTOs uh, to utilize these ARs in the congestion management process as well as the near term uh, market process. Right. Uh, on top of that, right, if, if, if you're evaluating a transmission service or cutting a transmission service, anything that is less than 10 days, uh, ISOs are required to use this uh, ambient interest rating in the process. The full compliance is required by July 12th, 2025. So that's a key date for all the TOs as well as ISOs to be fully compliant. What does that mean? The TOs are actually calculating those ratings and providing those ratings to the, T, uh, to the ISO RTOs, and then RTOs are actually using those ratings in their, in their uh, relevant processes. So that's the key date. Uh, ISO filed, uh, RC West filed a compliance back in, uh, back last year, July 12, 2022. Next slide, please. So what we're doing, uh, we ISO created a couple of things. Uh, we created an internal project team uh, to, to, to help uh, achieve the target. So we have three different targets, uh, track one, track two, track three. Uh, you know, the track one is more on the real-time applications, right? Uh, real-time reliability applications. What does that mean, right? Uh, in the 881, there's two components. Uh, one is instantaneous uh, ambient interest rating. The other one is uh, look ahead uh, component, look ahead average interest rate. So in the track one, we're going to plan to utilize ICCP, right? That's how we're going to communicate with the TOs to get those ratings. Anybody has the ratings, uh, we can receive those through ICCP and use those uh, instantaneous ratings in our real-time uh, reliability process. Uh, the, uh, the status may, uh, the RTCA, uh, HANA process, right? make sure that we can use those ratings. Now, again, we will be ready. We, we plan to be ready by 2023, 2024, uh, Q1 2024. Uh, but we don't expect, right? Uh, if everybody, if, if anybody wants to yes, send us the data, we can use the data. So it's not a still a requirement for everybody, right? At the end of the day, the target is 2025, right? The TOs doesn't need to be ready by 2025. Right? If any TOs are ready uh, to calculate those instantaneous ratings and provide those ratings to RC West, we can start using those ratings. Uh, uh, work with your modeling team and create SCADA points and go through the model process, uh, model building process, and 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 receive the data through that process. That's track one. Uh, track two is more where we're looking into. Okay, uh, from a look ahead point of view, we need to make uh, we need to create new tools to receive the data. What is the format it's going to look like? So, so we're still deciding. Up, we're still working internally on that. We haven't finalized what is the format, what is the tools look like. So once we have more information, exactly, then we're going to share with, uh, with with the stakeholders on the on the track two, and track three. It's again for internally for us. Now you can receive the look ahead data. How do you use the look at data in the day ahead markets, uh, the day ahead uh, reliability studies that RC West is performing, right? So how do we use that information in the uh, appropriate processes? That's the track three. At the same, uh, uh, on top of these tracks, we also created a, uh, you know, we started sharing this information through public stakeholder process. Uh, we are doing a quarterly initiative updates. We created two working groups. Uh, one is data submission working group, it's public. The other one is, uh, it's a, 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 we are calling it as a methodologist working group. It's not a public, it's invite only. Uh, we had one meeting with the KISO PTOs, and what we plan to do is we're going to start having meetings with the RC West TOPs too. We're going to, uh, uh, it's going to be uh, invite only, but we could plan to invite all the RC West TOPs into that forum where we're going to uh, work on the methodologies. Uh, uh, again, the, the purpose of that group is to uh, uh, have uh, uh, like a, Best practices sharing. Uh, now some of the TOPs are actually implementing that stuff. They can we can work with them and actually share that information so other TOPs can hear. Okay, what is the thought process? What are, how are they implementing? Right? How are they gonna uh, gather the weather forecast? How are we gonna calculate those? How are we gonna establish those equations to calculate those ratings? Right? Uh, ambient interest rating. So that's what the thought process of the methodology is working group. Share that information. And, and anything the if, uh, anything the East is doing, right? We are we are part of the NAD of working groups. Uh, we are also part of the RC, other RCs in the East are communicating with us too, and we are communicating with them. So we, anything that we learn from them, we're going to share here, right? That's the, uh, that's the idea. And, and again, 
everybody has to be compliant. What does that mean? They have to update their transmission rating methodologies. All the TOs have to update their transmission line rating methodologies and develop processes. So we want to work with them and, and make sure that they're they're updating their rating methodologies uh, and be compliant with 881. That's the thought process. Any any questions on that? I know we had one meeting, but we're going to invite uh, RC West TOPs into those meetings. Any questions, any thoughts on that? Before I go to the next slide. Oh, this comment, I, I appreciate you guys are getting us involved, and, and the sooner the better. Uh, Pacific Core is definitely looking to be aggressive here to get implemented. So we have some time to work out kinks. Uh, and we also are going to be deploying a lot more real time weather stations so we can pull in that data, which is going to take time. So we're just trying to understand what packets you guys need, uh, data packets you need, so we can start that implementation. Mm -hmm. We are going to outsource some of that work. Sure. So, is the plan to run it in parallel ops when you start getting everyone coming in? So, again, the parallel operations, that's a good thought. You know, we, you know, the, the, we, we are working on a white paper to come up with how we can implement this because we don't want to uh, implement real-time ratings without seasonal rating changes, yeah. right? Because how it's going to impact your day head markets, FTR markets, right? So this, so this thought process, how you want to go to that. We are still finalizing and we're working on the white paper. Once we finish it up, we'll definitely share that. Okay. How we want to implement this, right? Just because the tools are ready doesn't mean you can start start yeah. using real-time, right? It's going to impact everything, right? That, that, that. Yeah, I think that the concept, <clears throat> If you go back to the previous slide, <clears throat> that the there wouldn't be like crossover like the track one, the, the consumption on the ICCP data, that's not going to feed the market applications. There's there is no crossover between ICCP yeah. feeding market. That's that's not the roadmap at all. It it would really be updating what the RCs are monitoring in real time and making sure that we're all monitoring the same rating, the same rating is going into RTCA. So th those are really the enhancements we're waiting for, and we're expecting those enhancements to be delivered this year. And then, basically, as, as entities are ready, we're, we'll start queuing them up to implement. But some of them it might take them some time yeah, if yeah. they if they still have to develop on their side, right? So the ICCP will be the first thing, and then the second thing we have a structure in place already that we're using with our participating transmission owners and also what we're doing just through the modeling process, right? So we're just expanding the columns kind of already in the in the current data makeup. And that, that becomes those default kind of backstop ratings that do get consumed into the market and right. the other systems. Um, so those that that structurally was, was a bigger thing for us kind of architecture wise to make sure that all right data was getting to the right places. Right, I think the one thing Trisha is saying, it's, it's more, if you start using real time, you've got to make sure that the seasonal readings are set up too. I think that's what I was referring to, right? If you, you don't want to start using real time without a seasonal reading adjustment, right? If you have four seasons, then it makes sense to use real time. I, I, what, is the, what is the order, how you want to use that, right? Uh, in different process, so we need to. Yeah, and, and then the market consumption doesn't yeah. happen until track rate, so. It feels like there should be some, it, it feels like there could be some potential false congestion. I, I just worry about this. Well, I mean, in, in theory, yeah, I mean, it's because the market could be using a more conservative rating. Yeah, you got, that, I think that's the thought part, right? You don't want to you, you do something in day ahead and then versus the real time. Mm -hmm. Even if you thought market, you're still using those in day ahead studies, right? You're not forecasting. <laughs> yeah, so this is this slide is, uh, talks about how do we consume the rating study. So that everybody's aware of that, right? There's two paths that we have: the types of PTOs versus RC West UPs. Uh, at the end of the day, it, the data gets into one same location. It's just how you get through. The one is the uh, RC West UPs. Uh, most of them work through. Uh, uh, more, most of them work through uh, 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 the, the XML format. Uh, there's some TUPs, small TUPs that work through uh, Excel templates, but everybody works through XML format. Most of the RC West UPs. Whereas kinds of TUPs work through our transmission registry process, uh, you know, then the, the, that's our, our 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 interface with the PTOs with the transmission registry process. So normally today the seasonal readings are coming through that, and they go into our uh, a, 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 a energy management system, right, EMMS system. That's a database to host all these readings, and then from there it goes into our uh, EMNA, which is our real-time applications, uh, RTCA and EMS. 
And there's an OMS where um, the way we interface uh, emergency rating changes, you know, anytime there's a uh, emergency rating change, it, 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 we, we work through the OMS and then that information gets to our uh, downstream applications. That's our normal process today. Uh, go to the next slide, please. So I think the big change, right, that 82.1 requires at minimum utilization of four seasonal ratings for all the TOPs. So that is, the, again, they can do more, but most of the TOPs that are thinking about four at minimum. Uh, same thing in East, everybody's talking about four. Nobody's talking about six or eight at this point. Uh, four seems to be common because for that perfect request at minimum four. Uh, so so once once uh, the TOs update their transmission rating methodology, right? Uh, the ISO PTOs will work with uh, uh, to the transmission registry process and update those seasonal ratings. Whereas RC West TOPs will follow the RC West IRL 10 data specification process to use those uh, seasonal ratings, four seasonal ratings. And then that's first component. The second component is the real time AAR, as I mentioned. Uh, both ISO PTOs and RCS TOPs will be uh, communicating through the ICCP. Uh, so that's the instantaneous uh, ambient test ratings. And we're planning to develop a new interface, right? At this point, it's, a, it's going to be a new interface, whether it's going to be the incorporated to the existing tools or a new tool is being built, it's still in the final discussions. But a new interface will be developed to acquire those look ahead ambient test ratings. That's the 240 hours. So that is another key, right? All the TOPs have to. Uh, 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 they have to forecast, calculate, forecast like 240 hours of data. That is 10 hour, 10 days worth of uh, data, right? Both normal ratings as well as uh, emergency ratings on each and every equipment that they're selling transmission service. So we're going to work with. I think that's what Eric was referring to the data template. Uh, I mean, we haven't finalized, but we're pretty close to what the tool looks like, what not. Oh, yeah, for the next couple of months, hopefully, we'll uh, hear from RC West what the data format is going to be before we actually develop the tool. That's the thought process. Next slide, please. So again, this is just a timeline, uh, what we are going through right now uh, from a track one point of view. Uh, we're going to, at least the main thing is, we're working on a white paper that will be shared uh, sometime in March uh, after first quarter of 2023. Uh, hopefully that will communicate how we're going to uh, implement this process throughout. Any any questions? I think that's it with the slides. Nope, no questions in queue. Thank you. Okay, for future agenda items, we have the next RC West Oversight Committee meeting. Um, be hosted at uh, the California ISO on Thursday, May 25th. Um, we'll have additional information posted in the usual places. And um, if you have got topic suggestions, you can send them to isorc at kaiso.com. And we are open to public comments. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, pressing the raise hand icon above your chat panel um, or at the bottom of your um, participant screen will place you into the question queue or comment queue. Um, if you are joined via regular phone line, pressing pound two will enter you into the queue. All right, I am not seeing any raised hands. I'm checking in the chat box for you as well. I do not see any raised hands and I do not see anything in the chat box. Okay, our public session is adjourned. Thank you so much. And Elena will start the executive session in like five minutes. Yes, that sounds good, thank you. Is it different link, Trisha? Same link. Thanks, everybody. Different link. Different link. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect. Yep.